Chapter 3 of Lone Star Planet by H. Beam Piper and John G. McGuire. Read by Mark Nelson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lone Star Planet. Chapter 3 New Austin Spaceport was a huge place, a good fifty miles outside the city. As we descended, I could see that it was laid out like a wheel, with the landings and the blast-off stands around the hub, and high buildings, packing houses and refrigeration plants, along the many spokes. It showed a technological level quite out of keeping with the accounts I had read, or the stories Hottie had told, about the simple ranch life of the planet. Might be foreign capital invested there, and I made a mental note to find out whose. On the other hand, old Texas, on Terra, had been heavily industrialized, so much so that the state itself could handle the gigantic project of building enough spaceships to move almost the whole population into space. Then the landing field was rushing up at us, with the nearer ends of the roadways and streets drawing close and the far ends lengthening out away from us. The other lighter was already down, and I could see a crowd around it. There was a crowd waiting for us when we got out and went down the escalators to the ground, and as I had expected, a special group of men waiting for me. They were headed by a tall, slender individual in the short black Eisenhower jacket, gray striped trousers, and black Homburg that was the uniform of the diplomatic service, alias the Cookie Pushers. Over their heads at the other rocket boat, I could see the gold gleaming head of the girl I'd met on the ship. I tried to push through the crowd and get to her. As I did, the cookie pusher got in my way. Mr. Silk, Mr. Ambassador, here we are, he was clamoring. The car for the embassy is right over here, he clutched my elbow. You have no idea how glad we all are to see you, Mr. Ambassador. Yes, yes, of course. Now, there's somebody over there I have to see at once. I tried to pull myself loose from his grasp. Across the concrete between the two lighters, I could see the girl push out of the crowd around her and wave a hand to me. I tried to yell to her, but just then another lighter, loaded with freight, started to lift out at another nearby stand, with the roar of a half a dozen Niagaras. The thin man in the striped trousers added to the uproar by shouting into my ear and pulling at me. "'We haven't time!' he finally managed to make himself heard. We're dreadfully late now, sir. You must come with us. Hoddy, too, had caught hold of me by the other arm. Come on, boss. There's got to be some reason why he's got himself in an uproar about whatever it is. You'll see her again. Then the whole gang, Hoddy, the thin man with the black Homburg, his younger accomplice in identical garb, and the chauffeur, all closed in on me and pushed me, pulled me, half carried me, fifty yards across the concrete to where their air car was parked. By this time the tall blonde had gotten clear of the mob around her and was waving frantically at me. I tried to wave back, but I was literally crammed into the car and flung down on the seat. At the same time the chauffeur was jumping in, extending the car's wings, jetting up. "'Great God!' I bellowed. This is the damnedest piece of impudence I've ever had to suffer from any subordinates in my whole State Department experience. I want an explanation out of you, and it better be a good one." There was a deafening silence in the car for a moment. The thin man moved himself off my lap, then sat there looking at me with the heartbroken eyes of a friendly dog that had just been kicked for something which wasn't really its fault. Mr. Ambassador, you can't imagine how sorry we all are, but if we hadn't gotten you away from the spaceport and to the embassy at once, we would all have been much sorrier. Somebody here gunning for the ambassador? Hottie demanded sharply. Oh, no, I hadn't even thought of that, the thin man almost gibbered. But your presence at the embassy is of immediate and urgent necessity. You have no idea of the state in which things have gotten. Oh, Pardon me, Mr. Ambassador. I am Gilbert W. Thromley, your charge d'affaires." I shook hands with him. And Mr. Benito Gomez, the secretary of the embassy. I shook hands with him, too, and started to introduce Mr. Hardy Ringo. Hardy, however, had turned to look out the rear window, 
Immediately he gave a yelp. We got a tail, boss. Two of them. Look back there. There were two black eight-passenger air cars of the same model whizzing after us, making an obvious effort to overtake us. The chauffeur cursed and fired his auxiliary jets, then his rocket booster. Immediately, black rocket fuel puffs shot away from the pursuing air cars. Hottie turned in his seat, cranked open a porthole slit in the window, and poked one of his eleven millimeters out, letting the whole clip go. Thrombley and Gomez slid down onto the floor, and both began to drag me down with them, imploring me not to expose myself. As far as I could see, there was nothing to expose myself to. The other cars kept coming, but neither of them were firing at us. There was also no indication that Hottie Salvo had had any effect on them. Our chauffeur went into a perfect frenzy of twisting and dodging, at the same time using his radiophone to tell somebody to get the goddamn gate open in a hurry. I saw the blue skies and green plains of New Texas replacing one another above, under, in front of, and behind us. Then the car set down on a broad stretch of concrete, the wings were retracted, and we went whizzing down a city street. We whizzed down a number of streets. We cut corners on two wheels, and on one wheel, and, I was prepared to swear, on no wheels. A couple of times, with the wings retracted, we actually jetted into the air and jumped over vehicles in front of us, landing again with bone-shaking jolts. Then we made an abrupt turn and shot in under a concrete arch, and a big door banged shut behind us, and we stopped in the middle of a wide patio, the front of the car a few inches short of a fountain. Four or five people, in diplomatic striped trousers, local dress, and the uniform of the Space Marines came running over. Thrombley pulled himself erect and half climbed, half fell out of the car. Gomez got out on the other side with Hottie. I climbed out after Thrombley. A tall, sandy-haired man in the uniform of the Space Navy came over. "'What the devil's the matter, Thrombley?' he demanded. Then, seeing me, he gave me as much of a salute as a naval officer will ever bestow on anybody in civilian clothes. "'Mr. Silk?' he looked at my costume and the pistols on my belt in well-bred concealment of surprise. "'I'm your military attaché, Stonehenge, Space Commander, Space Navy.' I noticed that Hottie's ears had pricked up, but he wasn't making any effort to attract Stonehenge's attention. I shook hands with him, introduced Hottie, and offered my cigarette case around. "'You seem to have had a hectic trip from the spaceport, Mr. Ambassador. What happened?' Thromley began accusing our driver of trying to murder the lot of us. Hottie brushed him aside and explained, "'Just after we took off, two other cars took off after us. We speeded up, and they speeded up, too. Then your flyboy here got fancy. That shook him off time we got into the city, we dropped them. Nice job of driving. Probably saved our lives. Shucks, that wasn't nothing, the driver disclaimed. When you drive for politicians, you're either good or you're good and dead. I'm surprised they started so soon, Stonehenge said. Then he looked around at my fellow passengers, who seemed to have realized by now that they were no longer dangling by their fingernails over the brink of the grave. But, gentlemen, let's not keep the ambassador standing out here in the hot sun. So we went over the arches at the side of the patio, and were about to sit down when one of the embassy servants came up, followed by a man in a loose vest and blue Levi's and a big hat. He had a pair of automatics in his belt, too. I'm Captain Nelson, New Texas Rangers, he introduced himself. Which one of you all is Stephen Silk? I admitted it. The ranger pushed back his wide hat and grinned at me. "'I just can't figure this out,' he said. "'You're in the right place and the right company, but we got a report from a mighty good source that you've been kidnapped at the spaceport by a gang of thugs.' "'A blonde source?' I made curving motions with my hands. "'I don't blame her. My efficient and conscientious charge d'affaires, Mr. Thromley, felt that I should reach the embassy here as soon as possible, and from where she was standing it must have looked like a kidnapping. 
Fact is, it looked like one from where I was standing, too. Was that you and your people who were chasing us? Then I must apologize for opening fire on you. I hope nobody was hurt. No, our cars are pretty well armored. You scored a couple of times on one of them, but no harm done. I reckon after what happened to Silas Cumshaw, you had a right to be suspicious. I noticed that refreshments, including several bottles, had been placed on a big wicker table under the arched veranda. "'Can I offer you a drink, Captain, in token of mutual amity?' I asked. "'Well, now, I'd like to, Mr. Ambassador, but I'm on duty,' he began. "'You can't be. You're an officer of the planetary government of New Texas, and in this embassy you're in the territory of the Solar League.' "'That's right now, Mr. Ambassador,' he grinned. "'Extraterritoriality. Wonderful thing, extraterritoriality.' He looked at Hotty, who, for the first time since I had met him, was trying to shrink into the background. "'And diplomatic immunity, too, ain't it, Hotty?' After he had had his drink and departed, we all sat down. Thromley began speaking almost at once. Mr. Ambassador, you must, you simply must, issue a public statement immediately, sir. Only a public statement, issued promptly, will relieve the crisis into which we have all been thrust. Oh, come, Mr. Thromley, I objected. Captain Nelson will take care of all that in his report to his superiors. Thromley looked at me for a moment, as though I had been speaking to him in Hottentot, then waved his hands in polite exasperation. Oh, no, no, I don't mean that, sir. I mean a public statement to the effect that you have assumed full responsibility for the embassy. Where is that thing, Mr. Gomez? Gomez gave him four or five sheets stapled together. He laid them on the table, turned to the last sheet, and whipped out a pen. Here, sir, just sign here. Are you crazy? I demanded. I'll be damned if I'll sign that. Not till I've taken an inventory of the physical property of the embassy, and familiarized myself with all its commitments, and had the books audited by some firm of certified public accountants." Thromley and Gomez looked at one another. They both groaned. "'But we must have a statement of assumption of responsibility,' Gomez dithered. "'Or the business of the embassy will be at a dead stop and we can't do anything," Thromley finished. "'Wait a moment, Thromley,' Stonehenge cut in. "'I understand Mr. Silk's attitude. I've taken command of a good many ships and installations, and at one time or another I've never signed for anything I couldn't see and feel and count. I know men who retired as brigadier generals or vice-admirals, but they retired loaded with debts incurred because as second lieutenants or ensigns they forgot that simple rule." He turned to me. "'Without any disrespect to the charge d'affaires, Mr. Silk, this embassy has been pretty badly disorganized since Mr. Cumshaw's death. No one felt authorized, or, to put it more accurately, no one dared to declare himself acting head of the embassy. "'Because that would make him the next target?' I interrupted. Well, that's what I was sent here for. Mr. Gomez, as secretary of the embassy, will you please, at once, prepare a statement for the press and telecast release to the effect that I am now the authorized head of this embassy, responsible from this hour for all its future policies, and all its present commitments insofar as they obligate the government of the Solar League. Get that out at once. Tomorrow I will present my credentials to the Secretary of State here. Thereafter, Mr. Thromley, you can rest in the assurance that I'll be the one they'll be shooting at." "'But you can't wait that long, Mr. Ambassador,' Thromley almost wailed. "'We must go immediately to the State House. The reception for you is already going on.' I looked at my watch, which had been regulated aboard ship for Capella Four time. It was just 13.15. "'What time do they hold diplomatic receptions on this planet, Mr. Thromley?' I asked. "'Oh, any time at all, sir. This one started about 0900 when the news that the ship was in orbit off-planet got in. It'll be a barbecue, of course, and—' "'Barbecued super-cow! Yippee!' 
Hottie yelled. What I've been waiting for for five years. It would be the vilest cruelty not to take him along, I thought, and it would also keep him and Stonehenge apart for a while. But we must hurry, Mr. Ambassador, Thromley was saying. If you will change now to formal dress. And he was looking at me, gasping. I think it was the first time he had actually seen what I was wearing. In native dress, Mr. Ambassador! Thromley's eyes and tone were again those of an innocent spaniel caught in the middle of a marital argument. Then his gaze fell to my belt and his eyes became saucers. Oh, dear! And armed! My charge d'affaires was shuddering and he could not look directly at me. Mr. Ambassador, I understand that you were recently appointed from the consular service. I sincerely hope that you will not take it amiss if I point out, here in private, that, Mr. Thromley, I am wearing this costume and these pistols on the direct order of Secretary of State Gopal Singh." That set him back on his heels. I, I can't believe it, he exclaimed. An ambassador is never armed. Not when he's dealing with a government which respects the comedy of nations and the usages of diplomatic practice, no, I replied. But the fate of Mr. Cumshaw clearly indicates that the government of New Texas is not such a government. These pistols are in the nature of a not-too-subtle hint of the manner in which this government here is being regarded by the government of the Solar League. I turned to Stonehenge. Commander! What sort of an embassy guard have we? I asked. Space Marines, sergeant and five men. I double as guard officer, sir. Very well. Mr. Thromley insists that it is necessary for me to go to this fish fry, or whatever it is, immediately. I want two men, a driver, and an auto rifleman for my car. And from now on, I would suggest, Commander, that you wear your sidearm at all times outside the embassy. Yes, sir and this time Stonehenge gave me a real salute. "'Well, I must phone the State House then,' Thromley said. "'We will have to call on Secretary of State Palm and then on President Hutchinson.' With that he got up, excused himself, motioned Gomez to follow, and hurried away. I got up too and motioned Stonehenge aside. Aboard ship, coming in, I was told that there's a task force of the Space Navy on maneuvers about five light-years from here," I said. Uh, yes, sir. Task Force Red-Blue-Green, 5th Space Fleet. Fleet Admiral Sir Rodney Tregascus. Can we get hold of a fast spaceboat with hyperdrive engines in a hurry? Eight or ten of them always around New Austin Spaceport, available for charter. All right. Charter one and get out to that fleet. Tell Admiral Tregascus that the ambassador at New Austin feels in need of protection. Possibility of the Sroff invasion. I'll give you written orders. I want the fleet within radio call. How far out would that be with our facilities? The embassy radio isn't reliable beyond about sixty light minutes, sir. Then tell Sir Rodney to bring his fleet in that close. The invasion, if it comes, will probably not come from the direction of the Zesroff star cluster. They'll probably jump past us and move in from the other side. I hope you don't think I'm having nightmares, Commander. Danger of a Zesroff invasion was pointed out to me by persons on the very highest level, on Luna. Stonehenge nodded. I'm always having the same kind of nightmare, sir, especially since this special envoy arrived here ostensibly to negotiate a meteor mining treaty. He hesitated for a moment. We don't want the new Texans to know, of course, that you've sent for the fleet. Naturally not. Well, if I can wait until about midnight before I leave, I can get a boat owned, manned, and operated by Solar League people. The boat's a dreadful-looking old tub, but she's sound and fast. The gang who own her are pretty notorious characters suspected of smuggling, piracy, and what not, but they'll keep their mouths shut if well paid. Then pay them well, I said, and it's just as well you're not leaving at once. When I get back from this clambake, I'll want to have a general informal council, and I certainly want you in on it. 
On the way to the State House in the air car, I kept wondering just how smart I had been. I was pretty sure that the Zesroff were getting ready for a sneak attack on New Texas, and, as Solar League ambassador, I, of course, had the right to call on the Space Navy for any amount of armed protection. Sending Stonehenge off on what couldn't be less than an eighteen-hour trip would delay anything he and Hottie might be cooking up, too. On the other hand, with the fleet so near, they might decide to have me rubbed out in a hurry, to justify seizing the planet ahead of the Zesroff. I was in that pleasant spot called, Damned If You Do and Damned If You Don't. Chapter 4 The State House appeared to cover about a square mile of ground, and it was an insane jumble of buildings piled beside and on top of one another, as though it had been in continuous construction ever since the planet was colonized, eighty-odd years before. At what looked like one of the main entrances, the car stopped. I told our marine driver and auto rifleman to park the car and take in the barbecue, but to leave word with the doorman where they could be found. Hottie, Thromley, and I went in, to be met by a couple of New Texas Rangers, one of them the officer who had called at the embassy. They guided us to the office of the Secretary of State. "'We're dreadfully late,' Thromley was fretting. "'I do hope we haven't kept the Secretary waiting too long.' From the looks of him, I was afraid we had. He jumped up from his desk and hurried across the room as soon as the receptionist opened the door for us, his hand extended. "'Good afternoon, Mr. Thromley,' he burbled nervously. "'And this is the new ambassador, I suppose. And this—' He caught sight of Hottie Ringo, bringing up the rear, and stopped short, hand flying to an open mouth. "'Oh, dear me!' So far, I had been building myself a new Texas stereotype from Hottie Ringo and the ranger officer, who had chased us to the embassy. But this frightened little rabbit of a fellow simply didn't fit in. An alien would be justified in assigning him to an entirely different species. Thromley introduced me. I introduced Hottie as my confidential secretary and adviser. We all shook hands, and Thromley dug my credentials out of his briefcase and handed them to me and I handed them to the Secretary of State, Mr. William A. Palm. He barely glanced at them, then shook my hand again fervently, and mumbled something about inexpressible pleasure and entirely acceptable to my government. That made me the accredited and accepted ambassador to New Texas. Mr. Palm hoped, or said he hoped, that my stay in New Texas would be long and pleasant. He seemed rather less than convinced that it would be. His eyes kept returning in horrified fascination to my belt. Each time they would focus on the butts of my Krupp Tatas, he would pull them resolutely away again. "'And now we must take you to President Hutchinson. He is most anxious to meet you, Mr. Silk. If you will please come with me.' Four or five rangers who had been loitering the hall outside moved to follow us as we went toward the elevator. Although we had come into the building onto a floor only a few feet above street level, we went down three floors from the hallway outside the Secretary of State's office, into a huge room, the concrete floor of which was oil-stained, as though vehicles were continually being driven in and out. It was about a hundred feet wide, and two or three hundred in length. Daylight was visible through open doors at the end. As we approached them, the rangers fanning out on either side in front of us, I could hear a perfect bedlam of noise outside, shouting, singing, dance-band music, interspersed with the banging of shots. When we reached the doors at the end, we emerged into one end of a big rectangular plaza, at least five hundred yards in length. Most of the uproar was centered at the opposite end where several thousand people, in costumes colored through the whole spectrum, were milling about. There seemed to be at least two square dances going on, to the music of competing bands. At the distant end of the plaza, over the heads of the crowd, I could see the piles and tracks of an overhead crane, towering above what looked like an open hearth furnace. Between us and the bulk of the crowd, in a cleared space, two medium tanks, heavily padded with mats, were ramming and trying to overturn each other, 
the mob of spectators crowding as close to them as they dared. The din was positively deafening, though we were at least two hundred yards from the center of the crowd. "'Oh, dear, I always dread these things,' Palm was saying. "'Yes, absolutely anything could happen,' Thromley twittered. "'Man, this is a real barbecue,' Hadi gloated. "'Now I really feel at home.' "'Over this way, Mr. Silk,' Palm said, guiding me toward the short end of the plaza on our left. "'We will see the President, and then—' he gulped. Then we all go down to the barbecue." In the center of the short end of the plaza, dwarfed by the monster bulks of steel and concrete and glass around it, stood a little old building of warm-tinted adobe. I had never seen it before, but somehow it was familiar-looking. And then I remembered. Although I had never seen it before, I had seen it pictured many times, pictured under attack with gun-smoke spouting from windows and parapets. I plucked Thromley's sleeve. Isn't that a replica of the Alamo? He was shocked. Oh, dear, Mr. Ambassador, don't let anybody hear you ask that. That's no replica. It is the Alamo, the Alamo. I stood there a moment looking at it. I was remembering, and finally understanding, what my psycho-history lessons about the Romantic Freeze had meant. They had taken this little mission fort down, brick by adobe brick, loaded it carefully into a spaceship, brought it here, forty-two light-years away from Terra, and reverently set it up again. Then they had built a whole world and a whole social philosophy around it. It had been the dissatisfied, of course, the discontented, the dreamers who had led the vanguard of man's explosion into space, following the discovery of the hyperspace drive. They had gone from Terra, cherishing dream of things that had been dumped into the dustbin of history, carrying with them pictures of ways of life that had passed away, or that had never really been. Then, in their new life, on new planets, they had set to work making those dreams and those pictures live. And many times they had come close to succeeding. These Texans now, they had left behind the cold fact that it had been their state's great industrial complex that had made their migration possible. They ignored the fact that their life here on Capella IV was possible only by application of modern industrial technology. That rodeo down the plaza tank-tilting instead of bronco-busting. Here they were, living frozen in a romantic dream, a world of roving cowboys and ranch kingdoms. No wonder Hottie hadn't liked the books I had been reading on the ship. They shook the fabric of that dream. There were people moving about, at this relatively quiet end of the plaza, mostly in the direction of the barbecue. Ten or twelve rangers loitered at the front of the Alamo, and with them I saw the dress blues of my two marines. There was a little three-wheeled motor-cart among them, from which they were helping themselves to food and drink. When they saw us coming, the two marines shoved their sandwiches into the hands of a couple of rangers and tried to come to attention. "'At ease, at ease,' I told them. "'Have a good time, boys. Hottie, you better get in on some of this grub.' I may be inside for quite a while." As soon as the rangers saw Hadi, they hastily got things out of their right hands. Hadi grinned at them. "'Take it easy, boys,' he said. "'I'm protected by the game laws. I'm a diplomat, I am.' There were a couple of rangers lounging outside the door of the President's office, and both of them carried auto-rifles, implying things I didn't like. I had seen the President of the Solar League wandering around the dome city of Artemis unattended, looking for all the world like a professor in his academic halls. Since then, maybe before then, I had always had a healthy suspicion of governments whose chiefs had to surround themselves with bodyguards. But the President of New Texas, John Hutchinson, was alone in his office when we were shown in. He got up and came around his desk to greet us a slender, stoop-shouldered man in a black-and-gold lace jacket. He had a narrow, compressed mouth, 
and eyes that seemed to be watching every corner of the room at once. He wore a pair of small pistols in cross-body holsters under his coat, and he always kept one hand or the other close to his abdomen. He was like, and yet unlike, the Secretary of State. Both had the look of hunted animals. But where Palm was a rabbit, twitching to take flight at the first whiff of danger, Hutchinson was a cat who hears hounds baying, ready to run if he could, or claw if he must. "'Good day, Mr. Silk,' he said, shaking hands with me after the introductions. "'I see you're healed. You're smart. You wouldn't be here today if poor Silas Cumshaw had been as smart as you are. Great man, though, a wise and a far-seeing statesman. He and I were real friends.' "'You know who Mr. Silk brought with him as a bodyguard?' Palm asked. "'Hadi Ringo.' "'Oh, my God! I thought this planet was rid of him!' The President turned to me. "'You got a good trigger man, though, Mr. Ambassador. Good man to watch your back for you. But a lot of folks here won't thank you for bringing him back to New Texas.' He looked at his watch. "'We have time for a little drink before we go outside, Mr. Silk,' he said. Care to join me?" I assented, and he got a bottle of super-bourbon out of his desk, with four glasses. Palm got some water tumblers and brought the pitcher of ice water from the cooler. I noticed that the new Texas Secretary of State filled his three-ounce liquor glass to the top and gulped it down at once. He might act as though he were descended from a long line of maiden ants, but he took his liquor in blasts that would have floored a spaceport labor boss. We had another drink, a little slower, and chatted for a while, and then Hutchinson said regretfully that we'd have to go outside and meet the folks. Outside, our guards, Hoddy, the two Marines, the rangers who had escorted us from Palm's office and Hutchinson's retinue, surrounded us and we made our way down the plaza through the crowd. The din, ear-piercing yells, whistles, cowbells, pistol shots, the cacophony of the two dance bands, and the chorus singing, of which I caught only the words, The skies of freedom are above you, was as bad as New Year's Eve in Manhattan or Nairobi or New Moscow on Terra. "'Don't take all this as a personal tribute, Mr. Silk,' Hutchinson screamed into my ear. "'On this planet, to paraphrase Nietzsche, a good barbecue halloweth any cause.' That surprised me at the moment. Later I found out that John Hutchinson was one of the leading scholars on New Texas, and had once been president of one of their universities. New Texas Christian, I believe. As we got up onto the platform, close enough to the barbecue pits to feel the heat from them, somebody let off what sounded like a fifty-millimeter anti-tank gun five or six times. Hutchinson grabbed a microphone and bellowed into it. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. The noise began to diminish, slowly, until I could hear one voice in the crowd below. Shut up, you damn fools! We can't eat till this is over! Hutchinson introduced me in a very few words. I gathered that lengthy speeches at barbecues were not popular on New Texas. Ladies and gentlemen, I yelled into the microphone. Appreciative as I am of this honor, there is one here who is more deserving of your notice than I, one to whom I also pay homage. He's over there on the fire, and I want a slice of him as soon as possible." That got a big ovation. There was, beside the water pitcher, a bottle of super-bourbon. I ostentatiously threw the water out of the glass, poured a big shot of the corrosive stuff, and downed it. For God's sake, let's eat, I finished. Then I turned to Thrombley, who was looking like a priest who had just seen the bishop spit in the holy water font. Stick close to me, I whispered. Cue me in on the local notables and the other members of the diplomatic corps. Then we all got down off the platform, and a band climbed up and began playing one of those raucous cowboy ballads which had originated in Manhattan about the middle of the twentieth century. "'The sandwiches'll be here in a moment, Mr. Ambassador!' Hutchinson screamed, in effect whispered in my ear. 
Don't feel any reluctance about shaking hands with a sandwich in your other hand. That's standard practice here. You struck just the right note up there. That business with the liquor was positively inspired. The sandwiches, huge masses of meat and hot relish, wrapped in tortillas of some sort, arrived and I bid into one. I'd been eating super-cow all my life, frozen or electron-beamed for transportation, and now I was discovering that I had never really eaten super-cow before. I finished the first sandwich in surprisingly short order, and was starting on my second when the crowd began coming. First the diplomatic corps, the usual collection of weirdies, human and otherwise. There was the ambassador from Tara, in a suit of what his planet produced as a substitute for Irish homespuns. His embassy, if it was like the others I had seen elsewhere, would be an outsized cottage with whitewashed walls and a thatched roof, with a bowl of milk outside the door for the little people. The ambassador from Alpharats too, the South African nationalist planet, with a full beard and an old-fashioned plug hat and tailcoat. They were a frustrated lot. They had gone into space to practice apartheid, and had settled on a planet where there was no other intelligent race to be superior to. The Mormon ambassador from Deseret, Delta Camilla Partilis V, the ambassador from Spica Seven, a short, jolly-looking little fellow with a head like a seal's, long arms, short legs, and a tail like a kangaroo's. The ambassador from Beta Cephas VI, who could have passed for a human if he hadn't had blood with a copper base instead of iron. His skin was a dark green, and his hair was a bright blue. I was beginning to correct my first impression that Thrombley was a complete dithering fool. He stood at my left elbow, whispering the names and governments and home planets of the ambassadors as they came up handing me little slips of paper on which he had written phonetically correct renditions of the greetings I would give them in their own language. I was still twittering a reply to the greeting of Nana Debadian from Beta Cephas VI when he whispered to me, Here it comes, sir, the Zisroff. The Zisroff were reasonably close to human stature and appearance, allowing for the fact that their ancestry had been canine instead of simian. They had, of course, longer and narrower jaws than we have, and definitely carnivorous teeth. There were stories floating around that they enjoyed barbecued terran even better than they did super-cow and hot relish. This one advanced, extending his three-fingered hand. "'I am most happy to make connection with Solar League representative,' he said. "'I am named Gulafer Dispatan Vuvuvu. No wonder Thrombley let him introduce himself. I answered in the basic English that was all he'd admit to understanding. The name of your great nation has gone before you to me. The stories we tell to our young of you are at the top of our books. I have hoped to make great pleasure in you and me to be friends. Gugalafer Vuvuvu's smile wavered a little at the oblique reference to the couple of trouncings our space navy had administered to Zisroff's ships in the past. "'We will be in the same place again times with no number,' the alien replied. "'I have hope for you that time you are in this place will be long, and will put pleasure in your heart.' Then the pressure of the line behind him pushed him on. Cabinet members, Senators and representatives, prominent citizens, mostly Judge so-and-so or Colonel this and that. It was all a blur, so much so that it was an instant before I recognized the gleaming golden hair and the statuesque figure. "'Thank you. I have met the ambassador.' The lovely voice was shaking with restrained anger. "'Gale!' I exclaimed. "'Your father coming to the barbecue, Gale?' President Hutchinson was asking. He ought to be here any minute. He sent me on ahead from the hotel. He wants to meet the ambassador. That's why I joined the line. Well, I suppose I leave Mr. Silk in your hands for a while, Hutchinson said. I ought to circulate around a little. Yes, just leave him in my hands, she said vindictively. What's wrong, Gail? I wanted to know. 
I know, I was supposed to meet you at the spaceport, but you made a beautiful fool of me at the spaceport. Look, I can explain everything. My embassy staff insisted on hurrying me off. Somebody gave a high-pitched whoop directly behind me and emptied the clip of a pistol. I couldn't even hear what else I said. I couldn't hear what she said either, but it was something angry. You have to listen to me, I roared in her ear. I can explain everything. Any diplomat can explain anything, she shouted back. Look, Gail, you're hanging an innocent man, I yelled back at her. I'm entitled to a fair trial. Somebody on the platform began firing his pistol within inches of the loudspeakers, and it sounded like an H-bomb going off. She grabbed my wrist and dragged me toward a door under the platform. Down here, she yelled, and this better be good, Mr. Silk. We went down a spiral ramp lighted by widely scattered overhead lights. Space attack shelter, she explained. And look, what goes on in spaceships is one thing, but it's as much as a girl's reputation is worth to come down here during a barbecue. There seemed to be quite few girls at that barbecue who didn't care what happened to their reputations. We discovered that after looking into a couple of passageways that branched off the entrance. Over this way, Gale said. Confederate Court's building. There won't be anything going on over here now. I told her, with as much humorous detail as possible, about how Thromley had shanghaied me to the embassy, and about the chase by the rangers. Before I was half through, she was laughing heartily, all traces of her anger gone. Finally, we came to a stairway, and at the head of it, to a small door. It's been four years that I've been away from here, she said. I think there's a reading room of the law library up here. Let's go in and enjoy the quiet for a while. But when we opened the door, there was a ranger standing inside. Come to see a trial, Mr. Silk? Oh, hello, Gail. Just in time. They're going to prepare for the next trial. As he spoke, something clicked at the door. Gail looked at me in consternation. Now we're locked in, she said. We can't get out till the trial's over. End of chapter 4